Well, where to start? How about this? A week ago, after this story broke, the Prime Minister trotted his people out in all directions to say Nigel Wright was a hero. He was honourable, and he had his full confidence. Not anymore. Wright is not only under the bus, it's been driven over him, backed up and driven over him again and again. From hero to zero in a week. Bruce is in Calgary tonight. Chantel is in Montreal. Andrew is here in Toronto. Bruce, you've uh, worked the Ottawa scene for quite a long time. Have you ever, ever seen anything like that? No, nothing quite like this, Peter. This is a stunning reversal of position by the government. Uh, some say it happened very quickly, but I think the problem for the government is it actually took so many days to unfold that the government established so many points on the record saying that this was a great man who'd done a great thing. And I don't mean to disparage uh, Mr. Wright here, but the government was squandering its political capital uh, very, very rapidly as it was doing that. Now, its message is getting a little tiny bit better, I guess, in terms of measuring whether it's likely to be a little bit more resonant, but still quite confused. Yesterday, we heard uh, that the Prime Minister had acted immediately upon learning the details of this transaction. Today, he uh, himself indicated that he perhaps should have acted more quickly. It's hard to square those uh, messages. And finally, um, we heard the, the word sorry yesterday after several days, probably five days, and that was probably about five days too late for most Canadians. A lot has happened in the last 48 hours since we last talked on, on Tuesday night. Where, where are we in this story now, Andrew? Uh, it's hard to say. It, on the one hand, it's a uh, short answer. On the one hand, it's metastasizing. You've got a number of different players who cannot necessarily be counted upon from the Prime Minister's perspective to stay quiet. So uh, here's Mike Duffy popping up today and saying some, some cryptic things. You've got the, uh, the head of the Senate Audit Committee, the Senate uh, Internal Economy Committee, um, um, saying some things that raise a lot of eyebrows today as well. And that's not going to go away anytime soon. On the other hand, uh, partly because they've decided to drive the bus back and forth over Nigel Wright, they at least have a somewhat more consistent, somewhat more coherent, somewhat more believable story uh, coming out of the Prime Minister's mouth. He doesn't look quite as sick as he did two days ago. The trouble is, as Bruce said, is if it's a week late, then you're, 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 it raises the question, is this how somebody who has nothing to hide and wants everything to come out behaves? Do they wait a week to do it, or do they do it from the get-go? If he was as angry as he says he was, and if he was uh, as blameless as he says he was, it's, it's odd behavior. It's better than it was, but they've still got a long way to go. Where do you see it, Chantel? Where are we? I think uh, the best news for the Conservatives is today is Thursday night. So they only have one day to go to the weekend in the House of Commons. But beyond that, uh, they have not managed to contain the story. They have not managed to come up with a narrative that at this point is sticking with the public. And you can see it. Uh, I was in the House of Commons yesterday for question period. You could see it in the face of the MPs. Not that the opposition was attacking them so effectively or, or, or scoring so many points, but that they were getting an earful from their constituents uh, in the writings and emails. Uh, and, and I think at this point, many of them are taking the full measure of how much damage has accumulated on the government over the past year and a half with a number of controversies, robocalls, go down the list. And this has kind of made it uh, crest onto them. So, uh, I, like Andrew, I saw the, the Duffy uh, scrum tonight, uh, and it struck me, as it might strike the government, that whatever they try to do to contain the narrative, there are many players in the story, and they have no control over some key ones, starting with Duffy. One of the things that struck me, uh, watching the House of Commons this week, with the Prime Minister traveling in South America, a couple of different ministers trying to answer questions on his behalf, and everybody being extremely careful in the words they used, almost like they'd been written by a lawyer. Even John Baird reading from paper. Never, I, I think we've probably never seen that before. I, I just want to show you 20 seconds uh, of sound bites uh, from the House this week. Uh, the content is really just framed for the kind of words they're using in trying to handle the questions they're getting on this topic. Watch this. My understanding that no such document exists, uh, as I understand it. Uh, the report does not, did, uh, in the end, reflect the fact that a repayment uh, that uh, had been uh, had been made. The Senate report, I understand, reflects the findings of the independent auditor. We are not aware of any legal agreement between Mr. Duffy and Mr. Wright. My understanding is that the committee report was based on an independent auditor's report. 
Key words there, you know, my understanding is, uh, as I am aware, they're all kind of like distancing themselves from this. What, what do we make of that, Chantel? Well, uh, I'm assuming uh, that the, they got from Nigel Wright as much uh, as Nigel Wright knows or has to say. I don't believe he's kept anything away from them. But I think it, it is a tangled web, and uh, listening to them, I think they are trying really hard to, to, to show themselves to be out of that loop, uh, which must have been a small loop. But once you get past Nigel Wright and to other players in the PMO, and everyone's been very careful to try to send the message that there were no other players, even to the point of looking like they're in the dark, which I don't believe they are at this point, uh, it, it becomes very delicate because then it could involve the person who has replaced Nigel Wright, Ray Novak, who is 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 deputy. It and uh, again it could go to the prime minister, which is what the opposition has been trying to imply that Stephen Harper was in on this. Whether you believe that he was or not, uh, the question is not being fully answered. You know, one of our friends and your colleague Andrew uh, John Iveson. Uh, wrote in the National Post. I want to read this, and this kind of fits in on, on, on all this as well. Here's what uh, John Iveson wrote, uh, I think it was uh, just yesterday. Conservative MPs are, for the first time in my experience, talking about open mutiny. The question for my caucus colleagues is increasingly, who is for Harper and who is for the party that will hopefully outlast him? That's a quote from one of the MPs that John talked to, and that was on uh, Tuesday, I believe, uh, that he wrote that. Open mutiny, Bruce. What are you hearing? Well, I'm hearing from conservatives who think, uh, who really do believe that the prime minister was caught uh, unawares of the transaction between Mr. Wright and Mr. Duffy. Um, so they give him the benefit of the doubt there, and I think that's in large part because they do, they have established a level of trust in him, and they they want to believe that he's telling the truth about that. But there's no question that they think that this has been badly managed. Uh, and to some degree, I don't think that they're all accepting the idea that this was just badly managed by someone else who worked for the Prime Minister and it ended up being something that was done to the Prime Minister in effect. Um, the most charitable uh, things that I've heard from Conservatives are uh, a perception that maybe Mr. Harper's been in a funk, that he's been so um, distraught by what's been happening to him that he's been unable to kind of assert himself in the way that they would expect him to as a strong leader. But one way or another, they're looking for him to take a more aggressive and successful uh, handle on this issue and manage it uh, to a level where the, the public might actually start to feel a little bit more that they can trust him on. It's these clipped words and carefully chosen sentences, they don't leave the public feeling more confident. They leave people feeling more worried that they're not being told the truth. Andrew? Absolutely. Look, you know, today we had the spectacle of, of uh, Mike Duffy saying he'd like a public inquiry into himself, uh, I guess, to find out, you know, what did I know and when did I know it? Uh, it's the same thing, frankly, with the Prime Minister. He doesn't actually need to, to refer things to the Ethics Commissioner. He could resolve all questions of this with a couple of phone calls. Uh, he, he, if he wanted to, we could have all of the documents and all the memos and open uh, interviews and press conferences with all of the principals. So the fact that we're not getting that is leaves one with troubling questions. And all the lawyered language that the that the cabinet ministers are issuing simply adds to that. So we're a long way from from trust, it seems to me, at this point. Um, you know, public inquiry, I, I was wondering why he said that. Public inquiry versus RCMP inquiry, you know, the NDP's been calling for an RCMP inquiry. That'll bury the story for well, versus, a long time, versus, right? Well, versus handing over the expenses that the auditors that he refused to give to the auditors in February. What do we well, need a public to, inquiry for? Uh, to start with, and then uh, if Mike Duffy has something to say about uh, all this, it uh, is very different from last week when there was no Nigel Wright help to him, uh, then he can give a news conference. But uh, I, there is really no purpose to a public inquiry uh, into when people decided to change their stories about uh, a fairly sordid affair, frankly. I would add as well, Peter, that the Conservatives are still doing themselves some political harm, I think, when they talk about how they were the people who invented accountability, and so presumably that means that they shouldn't be asked to, uh, uh, to live it. by uh, that principle. And they also then often go on to say that the other guys were worse. Well, Canadians expected a higher standard because they were told to expect a higher standard from this government. Uh, those lines aren't only not working, they're actually continuing to hurt the Conservatives, I think, now. You know, back in 2005, when in the middle of the sponsorship scandal, remember that night Paul Martin went on the air 
and uh, spoke to the nation. After that night was over, I talked to Stephen Harper on air uh, about this issue of whether or not he was really describing the Liberals as corrupt and Paul Martin as corrupt. Watch his answers on that, especially when he's talking about what a government needs to do. Watch this. Is his government corrupt? Um, I believe the, the Liberal Party obviously has serious corruption problems. I think it's difficult to try and say this part of the party's bad and this part of the party's okay, which is kind of what the Prime Minister is trying to say, except he doesn't actually know which people are which. But you know, you know what I mean, especially when you yeah. watch the proceedings in the House of Commons over these last couple of weeks. The impression mm -hmm. is clearly left that your party, and then sometimes you personally, feel that he personally is corrupt. My, my difficulty with the Prime Minister at this point, Peter, is that I don't think he's been forthcoming and honest on uh, fairly simple questions when there appear to be contradictions. Uh, my instinct is when somebody doesn't ask or answer questions, even simple and fairly innocuous questions in a straightforward manner, there may be something else. When you're under the kind of cloud the Prime Minister admits his government is under, I think you would use every opportunity to be as forthright as possible. So is he using every opportunity to be as forthright as possible on his scandal? Well, the answer to that is no, but you've just demonstrated that the worst or the most dangerous leader of the opposition that Stephen Harper has ever met is called Stephen Harper. Uh, there is little to say, having watched what he said, because by the standards he set out to you in 2005, he has not come even close to living up to them. But in a way, what he was saying, and I think it applies here as well, is corruption per se is not necessarily the issue. There's a lot of things short of corruption, short of out and out, you know, taking bribes, whatever. There is, I think, more, and we've talked about this before, a, a culture of expediency that takes hold in all governments to a greater or lesser extent, particularly the longer they've been in. And then this one, I think, it's been there in spades. And so it's not, I mean, the, the issue for a while was senators, you know, taking expenses they weren't in, entitled to, and I suppose that's petty corruption of some kind. But then the kind of expediency that kicks in that says, what do we need to do to make this problem go away? And what kinds of measures are, are justified uh, to, to take away a political problem that I think would, 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 doesn't count necessarily as corruption, we'll find out, but certainly counts as, as a kind of a, a, a rather slipshod ethical uh, landscape. I want to uh, have one more quote put up on the, on the screen, and I'll, I'll, I'll read it back. It's from Senator Marjorie LeBreton. She said this yesterday. She's used similar terms in the past as well. I am a conservative, and I know more than most around this town, populated by liberal elites and their media lickspittles, that's you guys, <laughs> tut-tutting about our government and yearning for the good old liberal days. And I know that we are never given the benefit of the doubt and are rarely given credit for all the good work we do. I think we've all heard this kind of talk from conservatives before. Uh, at this particular moment, is that the thing to be saying, Bruce? No, this is terribly counterproductive again. It's another example of the Conservatives uh, not being able to find the handle on this issue to uh, uh, to get on pitch, as they say in the music uh, shows. This is, and, and what's more interesting here for me in a way is, uh, Ms. LeBreton talked about um, not getting the benefit of the doubt in the town. And of course, we just looked at a clip from uh, Prime Minister Harper where he gave no benefit of the doubt to Liberals. He basically described them as all being corrupt. And that's part of the subtext of what's happening in this city. Uh, the Conservatives coming into office gave no quarter to the Liberals, and they're not going to get much in return. You get the last word, Andrew. They gave no quarter to the media either. Look, there are a lot of Liberals in, in Ottawa. Some of that paranoia is justified. But if you come in with a scowl on your face, assuming the worst about everybody and behaving that way, you're going to reap what you sow to some extent. But look, it's a lot of very non-liberal conservative journalists who have been tearing a strip off them over the last week. This isn't just liberal lickspittles or whatever. Yeah, it, it's quite a word, isn't it? <laughs> I applaud, I applaud the creative use of the English language. Yes, that's right. All right. Thank you all. It's, uh, it's been quite the week. And one assumes it's going to keep going for a while. Chantel's in Montreal, Andrew in Toronto, Bruce in Calgary this week.